So um, I had asked you to review a video for today. Um, and I toyed with the idea of having a pop quiz on it, but um, decided that uh, it would be better to cover this material a little bit more in class before I really considered that. So what, what did that video involve? What, what things were featured in that video of significance? Yes, here we go. Networks, yes, it was, it was all about networks. So can anyone tell me uh, what a network is or, or what are its building blocks? What are the things that make up a network? Anyone comment on that? So we were talking about a network. You know, our mind may rush out to social networks, to the internet, to, you know, networks uh, of roads, um, all sorts of particular manifestations. But what do they all have in common? When we talk about a network, what, what are we referring to? Anyone? Or no Look at that way. It's a set of nodes. Good. Which has uh, in segments. Good, good. Exactly. So good. Uh, so we have, and the terminology here varies actually. Uh, in, in fact, the very designation network um, is a, essentially a synonym for another term that's actually used more common in, in math. Does anyone know what the constructs we call as networks, which Arlon is starting to describe? What are those called in, in math? Anyone? It's uh, it's another common term here. Tim? Yeah? Graphs. Yeah, graphs. Graphs. Um, and network tends to be used in more applied contexts where it's applied to examples um, with particular goals. In computer science, there's many classic algorithm problems that operate on network, things like the max flow of a network, um, for example, uh, the path by which um, flow can, maybe it's flow of network packets or it's flow of liquid across a pipeline network, but it can, it can travel most readily. Um, uh, networks are, are commonly applied uh, across diverse spheres from business to um, uh, business to uh, health to uh, issues with uh, with manufacturing, you know uh, supply chains um, to uh, to issues with uh, physical connections between uh, between factors um, in computer science, widely used for communication networks, et cetera. Graphs are a more abstract term, but they really denote similar um, similar constructs. Uh, and but the terminology is a little bit different. So in networks, Ardalan mentioned nodes. Anyone know what nodes are commonly called uh, in math uh, in the context of graphs? We use a different term for it. So I'm sorry. Um, edges will come in in a moment, but uh, nodes are actually called nodes are the sort of Individual nexus is the place where edge to which edges come in. Vertices, they're called vertices. And really, this is vertices. Uh, tomato, tomato, potato, potato. You know, they're they're different names for the same thing. Um, nodes and vertices. And then beyond nodes and vertices, what are the other things we have in a network? Is it just a heap of vertices of nodes? They're connected. And the connections go by many names. One of the most common one is edges. What's another name you might use for them? Connections. Another name you'll sometimes hear is links. Uh, there, there's many particular names for these, but um, what do they, what do these connections connect? They connect together what, Ardlan? Uh, layouts of the yeah, agent modeling. Well, okay, in age-based modeling, yes, they, they can involve layout, but fundamentally the connections connect to what? From what to what? From 
of from one vertex to another vertex, from one node to another node. They link up the nodes, right? System science, complex, complex systems, uh, the study of complex systems. It's all about connections. It's all about the relationships between things. Um, it's not just the pieces, it's their arrangement to each other that's very important, right? It's not just the states in the state chart is their their relation to one another. Their how they're connected to one another. You know, to which state you can go to from the recovered state, for example, or which state from the infected state can you go to? Um, it's all about connections, and networks are all about connections, and they're often considered, therefore, a the fact that a system science, an area of system science itself, and there's a whole subfield called social network analysis, for example, which, which studies networks in the context of social connection. So, so that video talked about networks. Um, and, you know, if we were to go a little bit deeper in, uh, in seeking to define them here, um, you are not oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, I will. Uh, oh, okay. Yeah, Unzoom. sorry. Sorry, on Zoom. Yes. Um, so here we go. So if we were to find them a little bit more formally, and this is, is quite formal. Um, in general, uh, we will often deal with networks as being composed of a set of vertices V. So that's some set of nodes, right? A set of edges E. And just to make confuse you a little bit, but basically it says for each edge, we have a source of that edge, some node from, from which it comes and some target of that edge, some edge or some, some node to which it shows. So we might have a, a, a network here. Um, maybe I'll, I'll draw it over here so we have a chance of showing it. So here are our uh, nodes. And, and then we might have edges, for example, here. Uh, maybe I'll, I'll, I'll draw something like that. So, um, and maybe I'll label these uh, one, two, and three. So what would the node set be here? What, what's the set of nodes, anyone? A, B, C. So it's, a, it's some set A, B, and C. Good. Um, and what are the set of edges? I, I gave them a different designation so they wouldn't be confused. What are the set of edges? One, two, three. Good. Good. Um, and what would be the source? So there's some function that tells us for each edge, say for edge three, what its source is. What would the source of edge three here be? B. And what would the target of edge three be? A, right? Um, and and uh, so so that's for edge three, the target is A. Right. Um, how about for no, how about for edge one? Its source is what? B, and its its target is C. Yeah. So for each edge, you can there's a source function that will tell us what its source is, right? It's some function that will tell us for B. Sorry, for, for edge three, its source is B. For edge one, its source is B as well. For edge two, its source is A, right? Um, and then there's a target function that tells us for each edge what its target, what its the, the node to which it goes is. So the target of three is A, the target of one is C, and the target of, of uh, two is, is C as well. Um, so that's that's kind of a very general uh, definition of graph. It's actually called a directed multigraph. For most of our treatment here, and indeed in any logic, 
we're, we're going to be dealing with undirected nonbinds. Okay. And here we also have a, a set of vertices and a set of edges. But the edges are a subset of pairs of vertices. Okay. Um, so there can be at most one edge between every pair of vertices. Right. Um, so it's a subset. It could be all pairs of vertices in which all edges would have a length to, to each other. Uh, all vertices, vertices would have a length to every other vertex. Um, but uh, but it's a in general it's a subset. So some in, some nodes are linked to other nodes, and some are so so for a, for a given node, say B, uh, here. Um, it's linked to every other node, but C is only uh, has a has an outward connection to which other nodes? C has an outward connection to what? Not to none at all. A has an outward connection to what? To C alone. Yeah. So, and you'll notice there's further restriction. What is this restriction saying? And intuitively, what does this say? B1 is not equal to B2. Um, yeah, no, no self uh, self uh, connections. You can't you can't have B connected to B, for example, here. And I, I should have written um I should have written, should have written that a bit uh, more more carefully there. That's good. Um and what is this last condition saying? If B1 and B2 are in E. Then V two and V uh, V one are also in E. Anyone? Yes. Oh, not you. They kind of like go the comfortable thing. They are interchangeable. Like the order doesn't matter. Yeah, the order doesn't matter, which means it's undirected, right? Like if A is connected with B, B is connected with A, right? And that makes sense for many cases. Um, if I'm the sibling of Jill, Jill is, uh, you know, if, if Jill is my sibling, then I am her sibling, right? Um, uh, but it does restrict things a bit, right? If, if I'm the patient of Dr. Wei, that doesn't mean Dr. Wei is my patient, <laughs> you know, um, it, there can be directed relationships that we want to capture beyond them. But in any logic, all networks are undirected. If you wanted a patient network, my patients for a doctor, you, you can have that. Um, and separately, a patient would have a, a doctor. And you, you'd get a rocket. What things are allowed by this first definition that are not allowed by the second one? Anyway? Yes, okay. The first definition allows kind of like direction. So yeah, B to A and that's, C, but the second allows it's direct. So it's both like that's right. So you couldn't express this exact graph here on the screen with the second definition. Um, you could have another one that kind of looks like it. It has the same vertices. After all, you vertices in both A, B, and C, and it has the same edges, uh, one, two, three, in a manner of speaking, which nodes they connect to, but they wouldn't have directions on them, right? Uh, this edge three would go between A and B without uniquely going to A and from B or something like that, right? Um, so so the second definition doesn't allow directions to be captured. It also doesn't allow what to be captured. There's another thing it explicitly rules out. Uh, okay, multiple paths it doesn't allow. The first one does, right? You could, in the first one, you could have multiple links from B to A, for example, right? Um, this is three and maybe, you know, we'll call this four, right? And and it also goes from B to A, right? The source of four is B, and the target of four is A, and that's fine by the first one. 
but it's not possible the second. The second one, you either have one connection between A and B or none at all. Okay? The subset of pairs of B is what the edges are. So, so either the subset contains a certain pair, B comma A, or it doesn't. Hmm. Um, and it also doesn't allow one self loop. It doesn't allow a node to be connected to itself. So this is okay with the first definition, but not the second. And so is a self loop. In fact, multiple self loops you could you could have. Um, so so there are different ways of expressing network regress. And in fact, there's a whole family of, of different common graph structures, directed versus undirected graphs. You see that. Multi-graphs versus only single graphs being allowed between vertices. There's something called bipartite networks. Does anyone know what that is? Bipartite network? Mm -hmm. So you're getting the by does indicate two here. It's two different types of subsets of nodes. There's subset, you can think of it as the first subset and the second subset. And things in the first subset are only connected to things in the second subset. Things in the second subset are only connected to things in the first. They're not connected within a, a subset. Um, so that, yes. Uh, and it like says two part vertex with edges between two parts. Only. That, yeah, so, so you could have two different parts of the network. One part and the other part, they completely, they're mutually exclusive, collectively exhausted. They, they make up all the, the, the vertices in the network and there's connections, no connections within a given part. It's all the connections go from one part to the other part. So if you had veterans with service dogs, that would be, you'd have a total set of agents who are all veterans and service dogs. You, you'd have one group, which is the veterans, and another one, which is the service dogs. And each veteran is paired up with their service dog. And the service dog is paired up with their associated veteran. But you don't have veteran, veteran, or service dog, service dog um, connections. Service dogs don't have dogs, support dogs. So, yeah. Um, trees. Um, whether or not they allow self edges, whether or not they're weighted, either definition, they are a lot of weighted graphs, but they're very common. What do I mean by weighted graph? Any edges? The edges have a weight. I've sort of, by, by using numbers here, I've sort of hidden that, but you could imagine that maybe there's a number associated with each edge indicating how frequently that connection is made, how frequently, a sees B or something like that, right? Um, uh, or how big the road is between those two communities. These these could be people A, B, and C. They could be communities within Saskatchewan, and the you know the links, the numbers associated with links express the you know the distance, right, to drive the driving distance, or it could express you know the capacity, the the sort of capacity of, of the road in terms of number of vehicles per hour to support or whatever. Um, you could have networks for many different things. They could be companies or what have you. And finally, there's these things called hypergraphs where nodes, for example, can join together multiple nodes, or uh, edges to join together multiple nodes. So you might have something like this, for example, where you know, in order to produce a certain reactant, a certain chemical, you need these two chemicals and chemical engineering or in chemistry. So we have networks of many sorts, biologic networks, chemical networks, uh, many sorts. They're very important. Um, or they're very common. When it comes to agent-based modeling, or when it comes to characterizing complex systems, why are networks important? I, you heard some reference to that in that video, but, but why might they be important? What what things about them might might be important to capture? Why might you want to 
have a model that captures effects of networks. Anyone? Okay, so you could analyze, yeah, the the outcomes for their interaction. Um, okay, so if they are connected this way, you could look at the consequences, right? You could look at the consequences of when does COVID-19 go to small communities in Saskatchewan's north versus to the large cities? Like how quickly would it come, right? So position in the network might impact vulnerability or timing of when infection might arrive there, for example, that might be one thing. What, why else, what else might you want to capture with, with network? Yeah, uh, Tony? I'm going to say locality. Locality, yeah. So maybe I'm more likely to get vaccinated if people I know are vaccinated or have been willing to get vaccinated, or I'm more likely to believe a conspiracy theory about vaccination if the people around me believe this conspiracy theory. And that's a localized thing, right? It's it's not so much that I'm just, you know, influenced by people wherever I'm disproportionately influenced maybe by people near me, people in my network, one or two hops away. Ardila. Um, can it help us to be build a better agent-based model? So when we are trying to convince people like, the reason of our model, we say that, hey, because we found this network, these connections between these things, we were able to make a close to 100% accurate model. Okay. I mean, give them a better understanding, as you said, it, a map, as you put it. Yeah, I mean, it is true that sometimes characterizing structures in the world that we all recognize may make a model more compelling, convincing. Um, uh, understandable to people who interact with it. The fact that in our COVID-19 modeling for the province, we we could capture as COVID-19 the dynamics by which it would spread, for example, to urban areas first, and then to rural areas, um, the degree to which it would arrive earlier versus later, and, and particularly vulnerable areas. Um, uh, how it spread among certain more specialized uh, communities within the province, such as um, uh, colonies associated with religious groups or areas of Saskatchewan's north used for recreation in the summer, but, but also um, having uh, many groups where limited medical care is available, say on reserve. This was really important for credibility. And it let us capture questions about how to best stop the infection there, because we could realize, you know, this community could be reached by these roads. And so, you know, the community is is blocking entrance in this way. How much time might they that buy it um, to put in place other measures to protect the community um, while they have this temporary blockage in place? So, yeah. Um, when we're thinking about what if scenarios, when we're trying to convince people, these are all good reasons. Turns out that there's there's many other there's many other reasons, and generally uh, they reflect that you know that networks have profound impact. Uh, they lead to risk of contagion or not. They offer access to resources. Uh, if a community is tightly connected. With communities offering healthcare services, maybe it can, it can access uh, those healthcare services more readily than if it's only available via flyout connections, for example. And it can influence perception, as as was discussed, and attitudes, and and, and knowledge and awareness. Um, so um, I had a uh, an, an additional slide for motivations. I'm not going to go through this. Uh, you can hear other videos of, of mine uh, where I I do discuss this at length. But basically, if you want to investigate certain types of interventions, like interventions that use the network, what sort of intervention might use the network, employ a network to achieve uh, better effects? 
Yeah, so blocking roads, for example, that was actually done early in, in the pandemic by, by communities in the north, uh, sometimes recognizing the fact they have only one nurses nurses station and otherwise they have to fly patients out to Regina or Saskatoon. They actually limited traffic uh, into the community. So that's altering the network. How about building a network? I would actually argue there's a lot of things in the world that where that people or organizations seek to build up networks for good effect. Yeah, so building connections to see on expedite the process. Did anyone here go to the career fair? With the, our department? Well, you went to one of these activities that builds networks, right? You went there to learn about and get connections with companies. Has anyone here ever studied with a partner? No. Okay, okay, yeah. So you 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 built up a network to help you help you study in that case, right? Um, I mean, it's not just that. Even when you go browsing in the internet, and try yeah. to gain knowledge, you try to get to your visiting website. You are building your own network, so you can access the research on search and talk mad. Good example. Yep. Yep. Good example. Um, uh, when people want to exercise regularly, they might join an exercise class, or they might go in a walking group, right? Uh, they might, if they're trying to quit smoking, maybe they have a, a support network of other people who are trying to quit smoking or, or trying to trying to recover from from uh, a uh, from long COVID or what have you, uh, trying to get beyond, uh, you know, move beyond an addiction. Um, there might be network altering interventions uh, of of many sorts, and. Um, uh, you know, interventions can also be informed by structure. A lot of it on the health side, we we often will intervene at the core group of the network because it turns out that core group was so important for say an infection stay present, it would otherwise disappear. But in that core group, it's it's maintained. We'll be coming back to that um, when we discuss it in dynamic model. Uh, it can allow us to capture dynamics of the networks more accurately. Um, uh, the fact that maybe unvaccinated people tend to spend more time around unvaccinated people. Why might that matter? Yeah, because it will uh, it will increase uh, the chance that the infection uh, will get to the unvaccinated people. Because people, when they say we are already got it, or yeah. they have the vaccine. I mean, it comes to the mind of a normal person who doesn't know what the vaccination means, that they are now safe, so they go with other people who are not vaccinated. I mean, yeah. there are two chances. The two who are not, not vaccinated, they have a disease. There is yeah. still a chance that they might get it, yeah. but it, it is very, very low. Or almost like, it's up with being like 80%, it is now 30%. Okay, well, you know, we don't have time for a full discussion of it, but basically, it does lead to points of a special vulnerability if, for example, people who are unvaccinated hang around with unvaccinated people because it means those who are can more easily catch a disease are around those who are most likely to have the disease. And you can end up having transmission from one to the other very readily. Uh, in ways that you otherwise would and might survive in that pocket in ways that would, it would otherwise die up. So you can have a group that doesn't get vaccinated for measles, for example, and and measles may not be able to survive in the broader population, but it might survive in that subgroup due to collective. Um, and you can get qualitatively different uh, dynamics in, in the context of what are known as, as scale-free networks, for example, where it it goes and and then explodes at certain points because it reaches high highly influential uh, people, and it can help you uh, representing networks can help you understand the the impact across the network. So with you know uh, within this is a TV network within Saskatchewan for a period of twenty years, for example, where the these clusters and linkages. Why might it matter, for example, if you have so these are communities by large, uh, these different colors. Um, 
you notice that there's a link, for example, from this light blue beginning over here on the right to this kind of reddish or pinkish rose community over here on the left, that link over there. Why might that be important? And so if that link represents, for example, a, a person going back and forth between these communities who sometimes is here, sometimes is there, they appear in both places, um, and maybe they have TB. Why might that be important? Yes, Matthew. Yeah. Yeah, so if you had infection in this community over here, for example, it might spread over here, right? Um, so networks provide these conduits for spread. And if we want to understand why is infection spreading, from one of these communities to another, and how can we stop it from spreading? These individuals go back and forth, might be particularly key to help make lower the risk of spreading. For example, we might test them regularly, right? Uh, or we might want to work extra hard to make sure that they are vaccinated or they use protective measures like masks or whatever to lower the risk that they break hard to Yes. Can we use them as samples? Like people who already got it well already got it. Can you use them as a sample in a way that we can save others from using that sequence? Like uh, th there are ways. Um it it doesn't bear directly on today's discussion. So, but yes, there are ways that you can learn from those you've already seen get it and try to help help you understand what is that telling you about. Who you haven't seen get it yet, and and who's at risk, etc. Uh, I won't I won't go into that here, but it is true. So, um, uh, one of the most important things I want to be able to communicate from today's lecture, and expect you to acquire from today's lecture and the video, or an understanding of certain very common types of knowledge. These are common across many spheres. Um, the particular example we'll be using to explore these happens to be in the health area, but you'll see them in, in many different contexts. For example, scale-free networks have been discussed in diverse areas, supply chain networks for companies, the structure of software engineering, um, uh, so software engineering artifacts. Uh, um, you see them in the context of influence networks uh, involving you know youtube influencers uh, etc scale free networks are a very common phenomenon that have been noted across diverse areas and in the video you will have seen many of these so i want to talk about them and the way i've arranged them here is in a different order than i talked about them in the video um i arranged them from what in some sense is the least is is the least structure, the least and the less constrained network on the top is sort of more heavily constrained on the bottom. And there's some argument that can be made of whether these two, the what store got small world and scale three, three should be flipped. But I'd like to discuss the big features. So the first is a random network, and it, and it goes by many names. Poisson random network, Bernoulli random network, Erdos random network. Um, here, the hallmark of it is that all pairs are equally likely to be connected. So if you have a, a set of nodes, you know, scattered, scattered in space, any, if you consider any two of them, they're equally likely to be connected to any other two. It's randomly wired up. Um, or you could think of it as a fraction of all possible connections are in fact in play. Um, so it's just willy-nilly connections connecting up different pieces with no sense of of sort of structure. The fact that one link is there doesn't tell you between A and B, doesn't tell you anything about their likely to be linked to their friends, doesn't tell you anything about 
about how likely one is to to link to the to the uh, to the connections of the other. It's just random. All all pairs are equally likely. Any possible edge is equally likely to exist. It exists with a certain quantum point. That's sort of the least structure. There's there's very little in the way of constraints. It's just independent chance that any possible edge will really exist. On the far side of that, we have been very localized now. One of them that you saw in that video was a ring lattice network. What what's a ring lattice network? Can I get something? It it forms a ring. Good. And yes, very. Yeah, they're connected neighbors. That's really the key thing. The ring is part of a nice way to take the end. But the idea is that people are kind of numbered, and they're numbered. We can think of them being numbered mod n. When I say mod, I mean I'm referring to modulo. Mm -hmm. That should be a concept most of you have been exposed to. Like, how would I count up modulo three? How would I count up? Give, give me the first six numbers modulo three. But if I count up, what, what, what would it go? It would go zero, one, two, mod three. Okay, maybe it's not a concept you, you're familiar with. If I count up mod three, it'll go zero, one, Wait, you two. Mod zero for example. I said mod three. Mod three. So both, yeah, mod both. Modulo three. Mm -hmm. If I'm counting up modulo three. Oh, one, two, three, one, two, one, two. Zero, one, two, and then zero, one, two, and then zero, one, two, and then zero, one, two, right? Yeah. Um, if I count mod two, that's binary it, and sort of a binary form and goes zero one zero one zero one right um uh now here we have all the people in the population and we we form them into a ring conceptually it's it's mod the number of people in the population so i'm connected with my neighbors left and right who have nearby numbers mod the size of the population. Um, so uh, here I we have people. Um, maybe there are ten people in the population, and they're arranged in a big ring, right? Um, and and we're connected up with uh, with ones who are nearby, right? Um, uh, in either direction. And I say modulo because it wraps it wraps around. Um, so we could think of this person here as being connected with one on the left and one on the right, for example. That's a ring lattice network. That has a lot of structure to it. Um, if I know about the connections of this one, I know a huge amount about the connections of the next person, for example. Um, the presence of one connection tells me a lot about the presence of another. Um, and then there's this thing called the distance-based network and in general in multiple dimensions. In any logic, it's most commonly used in two dimensions. And here, a pair of nodes is connected. Two nodes are connected if and only if they lie within a certain distance of each other. Right? Only if they're close are they connected. That's also very constrained. If I'm connected with, you know, a, a, a nearby person that tells, tells a lot about when my connection is relative to theirs, and if they're connected to another person, I'm, that means those two are close together, I'm more likely to be connected to that person too, right? If I'm nearby Ushwal here, and Ushwal is near Tony, chances are I'm pretty close to Tony too. Right? Um, the presence of one connection tells me a lot about the presence of another. Mm -hmm. um, so these are very constrained. These, there's a lot of structure here. There's a lot of specific. Yes. Uh, or like, like, right? Right? 
how is that connected to mod? I mean, oh, absolutely. Not in the so, so, so here, mod comes up all the time. Um, uh, we would number of people here zero to uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, and there should be nine. Uh, and then if there's 10 people, then it goes around. And so you're connected with your neighbor's mod. This is actually minus one mod 10. This is zero mod 10 one. So I'm connected with people who are one off for me. Zero with minus one and with one. Uh, one is connected with two and with zero. Two is connected with three and with one. And, and it, it's one because it forms a, a ring. It goes zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, and you're back to zero. You're back. Right. Well, a, a hash table is just one application of, of mod. That's just an arbitrary application. Like modulo numbers come up all the time when we are dealing with discrete mathematics. And this is an example here. We, we can express it with mod uh, very conveniently because we can treat these as being like minus one mod 10, nine is minus one mod 10, and you're just connected with people with nearby numbers. So zero is connected with minus one and one. Um, minus one is connected with minus two and zero. For example, um, and that's that's a convenient way of, of assigning these numbers. So, so this structure is a ring because we've expressed it uh, mod. If, if we just had zero, one, two, three, four, five, and so on, all the way up to nine, there'd be no zero and nine wouldn't be connected to the code because they're not neighboring. This is neighboring. This is neighboring and their numbering. Okay. Um, but the point is, these bottom ones are have a lot of structures. They're localized. They're very constrained. Um, I'm, I'm only connected with people who are nearby. The fact that I'm nearby U12 tells me I'm also nearby Tony uh, because U12 is, is nearby Tony. Um, now, the what's world strogas, the small world network. That one was a, a special one. It was kind of a hybrid. Which things was it a hybrid of? And this is like gold for the final exam. Like, this is like among the most testable stuff in the class. Um, so what is um what is a small world network as, as we looked at it in that video? And, and it's specifically called the what strogat small world network. What is that a combination of? It's a combination of two of those I just talked about. Okay, random and ring. So a ring is just where you connect with neighbors, but what stroke gets, most of the connections are with, with your neighbors, but some of them have been Rewired instead to be connected to a random other person. So there are these random long distance connections. Um, so maybe 90% of my connections day to day, of my interactions day to day, are with nearby people, people close to me. People are in some sense local to me. But maybe 10% of my connections are with people across the world, you know, um, across Canada. Um, and, and that leads to actually some big consequences. You might say, well, just 10%, but it's a really important 10%, these long distance. Why could that, why could that be so important? That there's just a small number of connections, even if it's just a small number of connections, the fact that they are with people far away, why could that be really important? Anyone? Yes. You got people who are in the far away can be connected to other people. Good. Good. Yeah. yeah. And well, it's like so, a chain. If it happens, it's connected, it will be, it will get connected and it will be kind of. Oh. 
Okay, so maybe I'll ask this. If, if infection were spreading in a network that was purely locally connected, like these, these rings over here, so suppose person zero got infected, how would it spread? How would the influence of that spread up? Zero and two. Zero and nine would first uh, might get infected, right? And if they got infected, where would it go then? Two. Two and eight, right? Um, and maybe one of them doesn't get infected and it's only going around this way. It's very constrained. The constraints on the structure, the fact that people are connected with nearby people lead to constraints on the infection spread. The structure of the network drives structure in the behavior. And generally it spreads in a very localized constrained way. Is that harder to stop or easier to stop than if it were jumping randomly? It's easier to stop, right? I mean, like, like put in place an intervention here, maybe make sure this person is vaccinated against measles and this person is vaccinated against measles, eight and three. I'm mentioning measles because it's a disease where if you're vaccinated, you're really, really well protected against even, even catching it. Three and eight, if I, if I vaccinate them, then it blocks them, right? Or if this person has recovered from measles, eight already, it can be like a firewall. I can't spread there. So, so when we have a highly constrained network structure, be a 2D or 1D or ring lattice, it constrains how it spreads. Meanwhile, a random one, one that's randomly connected, willy nilly, just sort of jumbled connections, how do you think it might spread there? Yeah, I mean, it could spread all over the network, right? It's it's not going to be blocked by clear sort of circle around some area, something. There's there's no locality to it. It could leap way across across the network, and it's really hard to block the spread because there's no there there. There's no like geometry to it that you're going to be able to block really easy, not you. Yes, yes. Recording in progress. Um, D. Um, so, yeah. Um, I'll let him answer. Um, so, uh, um, can it capture the heterogeneity? Yes. Can because you kept the fact, for example, that some people have more localized connections, whereas some people have broad, broad connections. Um, and uh, and that uh, that can lead to um, really big, big differences in, in how it spreads. And so the watts through gas network. If, if, th if things spread very constrained ways for localized, and they spread very promiscuously, broadly, and leaping across the network for Poisson, random networks, what do you think of small world networks? Let's suppose it's 5% distance and 95% local. How do you think it will spread? Will be essentially the same as 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 a uh, as a ring lattice, yeah. So it can leap, and the problem is, ring lattice by itself is quite easy to block. It's quite easy; it blocks itself if you have people recovering, for example. Whereas, what story got small world network with things being able to leap across the network, even occasionally. Even just 5% of the connections, it actually yields it much more like, like a random network in the sense that it's hard, harder to block. Um, so even a small number of long distance connections can really make a big difference. Um, uh, it, it's kind of like if infection were spreading, imagine, um, 
in a grassland. You, you have a really tinder dry grassland and you have uh, some brush fire. It might spread out in a ring, roughly a ring shape. But if that's all you're dealing with, you know, you're, you might be able to surround it, douse the ground with water and so on, or, and, and extinguish it more easily. Where it will really get troubling is if, if you start to have sparks that fly around, it can carry it to nearby areas and, and can start to leap the infection over to other regions, which then it will be really hard to block. These are like the long distance sparks that, that can move across it, these, these random connections. And just a small number of those can be quite uh, impactful in terms of, of how it spreads, lead it to spread a lot more widely and be much harder to block. What's the distinguishing factor? And by the way, the small world networks, you may be wondering about the name. It's a reflection of the observation and indeed the mathematical property that emerges from this. That in, in the world, often we have a much smaller number of connections between people um, than you might think. Um, so for example, if I wanted to get in touch with someone, if I wanted to get a, a package to someone um, in, I don't know, uh, Ulaanbaatar in, in Mongolia. I, I actually don't know anyone in Mongolia myself. Um, but I know people, I, I, I have a student who's from Inner Mongolia um, in, in China uh, from Ne Mongu, and, and uh, I could get the package to her and say, hey, can you try to pass this on to, to this address in Mongolia? She may, may, she has a pretty good chance of knowing someone who actually works in Mongolia itself. If she doesn't, probably one of her connections does. Um, and so it's actually a, a surprising fact uh, about the world that we're all connected a lot more tightly than you might otherwise think. You may have heard degrees of separation, this term. Like, and there's been folks who have commented, you know, any two people in the world are connected within six or seven degrees of separation, meaning, if you consider, you know, it's not that they know everyone in the world, but within six hops, for example, they might get to more or less everyone in the world. You know, I don't know anyone directly in Bhutan, but I know some people in India, um, and there's a pretty good chance they, if they don't know someone in Bhutan, they might know someone who works in that area of India who could get it to someone in Bhutan. And so, there's a surprising closeness in terms of number of hops to go from one person to another in the world. And small world networks capture this fact. If it were ring lattice, um, take this one here. If we wanted to get it from five to zero, um, you know, we have to go through a number of, of, of connections proportional to the number of nodes in the network, right? It's like, number of nodes over two here, um, but it, it would take a long time. Here in a small world network, we we have these shortcuts, right? We have these shortcuts that will get us most of the way there. It won't be perfect. It may not connect to exactly the person we want to go to, but it will get us most of the way there. And this allows huge economies, um, whether it's sending packets across the internet or getting packages delivered in the world, it also leads to ability for infection to spread from one area to another. Okay, so these are four types uh, of networks I've talked about so far. Distance-based ring lattice, these are both very localized. Uh, random networks, which are very unstructured, small world networks. How about scale-free networks? There was that final type. And these two capture a property of the world. Um, it's been noted empirically. What are scale-free networks? There, there's a technical way that I could describe them, but 
But at an intuitive level, what do they capture? Right. Matthew said it actually earlier. The magic word began with H. Heterogeneity. And here it's heterogeneity in number of connections. Scale free networks capture the fact that some people, some agents, have tons of connections, while some have, well, most folks have comparatively few. We see this. In all sorts of structures. Um, most networks, uh, most websites might have a modest number of connections, but still have a massive number of connections. And there's this power law distribution that means that it becomes a, a probably, if, no matter how big n is, if you compare. The fraction of these things that have end connections versus having two end connections, that ratio is always this power line and degree, degree. And it means that, you know, there's certain small fraction of all these things that, that tend to have disproportionately large numbers of connections, that they're concentrated in a small number of agents for uh, scale free now. One of the things that leads to this is, and it's very common, is what's called preferential attachment. And we see this in the world all the time. Can anyone say, if I, if I say preferential attachment in a network, does, does that mean anything? Preferential attachment? Uh, Harriet, yeah? Yeah, exactly. So, you know, the rich often are more likely to be able to make money easily than poor people, right? Um, someone who's really well connected is likely to get a lot of connection requests and a lot of a lot of new connections per month. Because they are introduced to a lot of people by all the people they know, right? Um uh, there's a, unfortunately for a lot of societies, there's a perverse perversion of the golden rule that says those who have the gold make the rules, right? And so they, they make it for their own benefit sometimes, but sometimes it occurs for, for natural reasons, right? Um, look, uh, if you're a site on the internet that tends to get a lot of traffic, People click through it a lot. It'll tend to appear near the top in Google searches involving that sort of thing, which will lead to more people going to it, right? And it'll success breeds success, right? Money breeds money. I mean, it's it's one of the shocking things about society that it's actually very expensive to be poor. Um, people who are struggling with low incomes often need to pay a lot more for certain things like maybe to get their clothes cleaned in a, in a laundromat rather than being able to have a lot uh, washer dryer of their own maybe they have to pay money for transportation uh you know on um on expensive unfortunately expensive transit systems when uh it might be cheaper if they have their own vehicle um they might have to pay a lot of money on rent as opposed to being able to purchase to have their own home. Um, it's expensive to be poor. And, and those who are wealthy often have lots of opportunities for investment, uh, for tax, you know, tax loopholes and tax advice that can get them to pay less taxes, et cetera. So there's a lot of structures that lead to piling on. So things with a lot of connections tend to get more. Companies that are highly successful, Google's, Meta's, or what have you, have lots of other companies that want to do business with them and can take their pick, right, uh, of, of their business partners, for example. Um, can take their pick of software engineers who want to work with them, right? Um, and 
this leads to this piling on phenomenon. And so scale three networks are often built up because things which have lots of connections now more easily get new connections. You see it with, again, the click-throughs to, you know, if you're a very popular site, you're more likely to have sites want to connect to you and, and their links. Or if you're a business person with lots of connections, people want to get to know you and, and you're more likely to get other connections. If you have lots of connections on LinkedIn, you're more likely to get people sending you connect requests, right? Um, so that scale three networks are characterized by this and they have the power law distribution. This is the key thing, please remember. In a scale free network, most nodes have comparatively few connections, but some nodes have massive numbers of connections. It's concentrated in few nodes. That's the heterogeneity, concentrated. And there is this power law distribution, which occurs regardless of scale, the probability or the, the fraction of, of those nodes that have two end connections compared to those having just n connections, the ratio of those is the same, no matter how far off you get. Um, whether you're dealing with 100 connections versus 200 or two versus one or 10 versus 20, you have that same ratio there. And so it leads to this long tail in terms of, of, of number of nodes. So let's go, let's go play around with this in our remaining time here. So I've asked you to go load in that model. And this model has a model of infection spread. Here we go. Okay. Um, and you should be broadly familiar with this sort of situation. So we have susceptible infected recover. We have some exposure, which occurs uh, when people are exposed. Really, it should be done with an option list. And if they're exposed, they have a certain probability of getting, getting infected. Otherwise, they stay... Um, they stay susceptible. So if someone's susceptible and they're exposed, they have a certain probability of getting infected. When infected, they expose people with a certain number of contacts per month, and they expose them by sending them an exposed message. Okay. Um, and there's waning of immunity. But what I want to concentrate on here is the fact that if we look in Maine here and we go down to space and networks, we have networks imposed. And I'm going to first change this to a random network, okay? I'm gonna have people arranged in a ring with a random network. That's the least structured of those options, right? This one up here, very little structure, very little constraint. If I'm connected with Uchwal, it tells nothing about whether Uchwal is connected with Tony or their Ujwal is connected with Harriet or something. It doesn't say anything about it. Each edge is just a coin flip, whether or not it's connected. Hmm? It may be 50% probability, or it could be 20% or 80%, whatever your 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 uh, chosen, um, chosen probability. Any logic allows you to say an average connections per agent. So I'm going to run this. We're going to arrange these people in a network, and I'm going to run baseline here. Here we go. Uh, and we're running them, and oh, that is a large number of connections. Why is it all black? Anyone? Well, I'm going to I'm going to reduce the number per per. Um, Per person, so you could see it. I'll turn it back to, to 10 in a moment, but I'm going to make it four per person. What do you think we'll see then? What will it look like? Anyone? It'll look like what? Uh, 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 yeah, so there'll be these connections here. Even that's kind of so many, right? Uh, maybe I'll try it even, even smaller. I'll try it too. Um, so Tony's right, there's fewer connections here, but I just want to give you a, a sense of how it's displaying this. Basically, these people are arranged in a, in a ring and and they're connected with other people in the ring and you could just see it gets very dense quickly, right? There's a link between any two people if they're connected. We have one person starting infected and 
from that, it starts spreading. And when it's spreading, does it spread locally or does it spread promiscuously? The lump leaping across the network. Anyone? Yeah. Well, yeah, it, it can spread well, good by chance, but remember, I'm no more likely to be connected with you than I am connected with Alex back there. Um or connected with uh you know uh someone in the very bad row there. So so you can get uh infection spread locally by chance, but but people are equally like to be connected wherever they are, right? Um now with 10 connections per agent, if we are to run this here, if we are to run this here model, so I, I ran it with uh, 10 connections per agent. There we go. Um, uh, as you can see, it's spreading around and there's no particular rhyme or reason to where it spreads. This is, what I'm showing here is the connections per person. What's the single most likely count of, of connections per person, roughly speaking? So this is a histogram. How the fraction of people who have a certain number of connections. So the number just to the right of five is the fraction of people that have five connections. So it's like seven or so from this bar here. Um, so what's uh, so the fraction of people with 15 connections, whoa, is is the bar over here just to the right of 15. So what's the single most likely number of connections that are, that people have here? Yes, uh and oh, so as I said. 10 is the connection per person. That's the average connection per person. It's just for every possible test, every possible pair of people to be connected to four people. Some people end up with fewer. Some people end up with more, just by chance, right? Okay, so this spread promiscuously, ladies and gentlemen. It spread all across the network in kind of a a way that that left. Now, sometimes it doesn't take off at all. Notice that one. By chance, it it didn't take off. By by luck of the draw, that person recovered before it spread. Same thing with this one. So it 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 might be might not get going, but if it does go, it goes quickly. And you can kind of see the induced graph over here. Here's the number of susceptible. Here's the number of infected. Shoots way up. Peak comes down and it's spreading now between different people within within this network as people lose immunity, et cetera. Just spreading around. No particular structure to that spread. Okay, so that was uh, the random network. Let's go now to a ring lattice network where they're connected only with neighbors mod n. So zero is connected with minus one and one. Two is connected with one and three. Minus one is connected with zero and eight, or zero and minus two. It'd be a better way to put it. You're connected with only with neighbors. So how do we expect this to differ? How will it? How will it be different? And how it spreads? Anyone? So we're going to have a, a small world. Oh, sorry, not small world. We're going to have a ring lattice. And we're going to be connected with 10 people again. But um, how will this affect how it spreads? Anyone? Neighbor to neighbor. So what will it lead to in terms of the geometry of the spread? Yeah. It's not going to affect everyone at once. It's going to be step by step. Step by step. Do you think it might sometimes Stop spreading? Yeah. Under what conditions, for example? Uh, that person well, doesn't get Okay, if they don't get affected or they get they get it and they don't uh, and they recover and so they're immune for a while, right? Yeah. So here here we go. Those expectations are borne out. Look, it's spreading along here, but look, it got bottled up, right? 
we could we can run it again. It again will spread locally. It's spreading along here. And notice it's not leaping apart. Why isn't it leaping across the network? Just want to make sure people are clear about that. Why isn't it leaping across the network? Turbid's behavior. In this case, it's the the structure of the network. Yes, our line. Well, uh, neither of them are particularly uh, particularly um, uh, realistic. In terms of in terms of what you actually see in the world, there are cases where distance space is not too bad. And if you have, if you consider Distance space, but distance space also misses the fact that people are mobile. Something we'll be getting to Thursday. Mobility. Um, but if you're considering the spread of sexually transmitted infections, a lot of it is spread locally. People take it from an old man. So people don't get STIs through the computer. Um, you know, there's computer viruses, but they're not SDI. They're not gonorrhea, chlamydia, or HPV. Um, uh, so it's it's a local phenomenon. Um, and uh, and so here, some locality is reasonable, but you do have you do have some mobility, notably, and small worlds and scale three are are seen in a lot of countries, and for SDIs actually for. For sexually transmitted infection, scale three is actually a really key lens to examine the spread because there are some people who have lots and lots of sexual connections and some people don't. Um, and you know, don't let your mind run wild. I mean, a lot of people with large numbers of sexual connections may not be in a position where they particularly like having that. So it might be a commercial sex workers, for example, people. Or trying to survive, you know, uh, by by making money uh, selling their body, and and it can um, it can be a, a very uh, difficult life. Okay, so I'm going to go back to Maine, and we're going to now put in place a small world network. Okay, small world network. So the small world network here, 95% of the neighbors, same number of connections per agent. We passed two, we've had 10 connections per agent. For the random one, 10 connections per agent. Spread promiscuously all across the network. For the ring lattice, 10 connections per neighbor, but they're all with nearby people, right? Zero, you know, zero is one and minus one and two and, and eight, maybe if they have four total connections. Here, we're going to go with small world, same number of connections per person, but 95% of those connections are with nearby people. It's like great line, nearby. But 5% are with random, some randomly chosen person across the network. Kind of like saying, oh, I, I, I know someone from India, for example, uh, even though most of my connections might be right here in sunny Saskatoon. Okay, so I'm going to run this network and run this model with 95% of the connections being local and 5%. What does it look like that? What does it look like this proverbial bar of uh, 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 yarn ball? Eh? What does it look like that? Because what? Yeah. Yeah. Most of my connections are with neighbors, but some are, are with people far apart. Is it developing exactly like a ring lattice here or different? Different. And why is it different? What can you see that's going on that's different from 
what it would be for the rate ladder. Yeah. <laughs> right. So it actually started down here at the bottom, but then it went way up there. And from there, it popped over to here and here. And, and now you've got it going in many, many places. Can you see this in a ring ladder? No. Ring ladder should spread high. No, very locally, right? Yeah. Outwards, and it slowly moved across. It was very constrained, very localized spread. Is it localized here? No. There was some type of network we examined. From this very floor, within the past 10 minutes, that this should remind you. Maybe not quite as quick as it, but it, it has that flavor, promiscuous spread. What was that? A random one. He thinks, ladies and gentlemen, just 5% of the connections distance-based. Just five stinking percent distance-based. And you get behavior that starts to look like a random network, not a, a, a ring lattice, right? Um, it starts to look like the very rapid spread and fall, which you may remember there from the random, as compared with, and I, I, if I were artful, I would have shown this, with the ring lattice, you do not see that sudden rise and, and collapse associated with it what you see is a sort of if it's spreading it shows in a small creeping way right um uh oh oh well that's interesting um so it died out very quickly that's why you you didn't you saw it go up and then down quickly because it actually just died out it it wasn't that it you know reached a peak across the entire network so here we go again and and it's spreading. And what you see here is, okay, well, um, here or two, it died out. So it went up and down, but then, okay, no, oh, sorry. I'm sorry. Oh my gosh, I've been, we should be looking at the infective ABM here. So it went up and down. This is actually the SD uh, by comparison. I'm, I'm sorry, I was not using that uh, appropriately. The goal is to compare the ABM runs with the SD and I, I hung out there. But the, the general idea we saw with our own eyes, right? Um, when you have very localized transmission, it spreads, it's a structure, a lot of structure to the network. It spreads in a very constrained way because the network is constrained. With a random network, it spreads very promiscuously. There's very little constraints on how it spreads. In a small world, even a small fraction of uh, of, of a um, random connection can lead to behavior that starts to look like that of a random network. And uh, scale free, um, you will have some key nodes where it'll explode once it reaches those nodes. Um, okay, uh, that's all we have time for today. I'm going to ask you to look at mobility and spatial layouts for certain things. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, what's the, why would we have a new one? What's the, you know? Uh, this is useful as a learning tool. Uh, yeah, like a uh, I mean, small world is a mixture yeah. of mostly ring lattice, with, well, it makes sense to me, like, why yeah. we use that? Right. It's just, if we think about small world, um, it's partly ring lattice. So, if you want to understand the behavior of small world, it kind of is useful to have ring lattice as kind of a toy um, that we can look at and have some understanding of how it, like, how some of those features do appear in in a uh, small world. Um, yeah, to further understand, it's very it's very uh, useful thing to think about very localized spread that you do see to some degree in small world. Yeah, uh, very locally until it jumps.
One day, like this one, I used to like into that dimension. Oh, uh, I mean, that yeah, yeah, so, uh, good question. Um, so, um, ring lattice, uh, as I say, is an example of a very localized network, very constrained network, right? Yeah, um, so this is one dimension in the sense that you're conceptually you're spreading along a kind of um. It's a one dimensional structure. It's like a line, uh, even though it wraps around it. It's, oh, I see. you know, it's not spreading in two dimensions, right? It's spreading just how far out are you uh, on this, uh, this line? It spreads sort of in this one dimensional way. The um, distance based, by contrast, um, is spreading. So if we do, sorry. Uh, if we do distance based here, um, here we we will see it spread uh, in two dimensions, and I'm going to place these uh, randomly, mm -hmm. and I'll have a distance based connection here between things. So they're only two nodes are only going to be connected if they lie within five units of distance of each other, okay? Um, and, oh, okay. So it doesn't look like things are connected. Okay, that's that's interesting. Give me give me a minute here. Distance-based, um, so I'm gonna make it a, a broader, I'm gonna say 25 here. I'm not sure what the threshold will be, but uh, this might be enough. Okay, there we go. Um, so this is a uh, constrained as well, right? It's localized. In the context of my lattice, it's localized. It, it's spread only in favor. Here, we also have spread only to neighbors. Now, this one recovered, so you can't really see the spread, but I'll, I'll run it here. Okay, um, and there we go. Um, so it's it's spreading to neighbors, right? You could see it spreading outwards to neighbors. Did you see that? Um, like if if I tone this down speed wise, it's probably going to be more clear, right? It's spreading to neighbors in this network, right? Just like it was spreading to neighbors in this one D network for for regulators to these neighbors along the line. To learn. Uh, sure, this one. Here it's spreading to neighbors and multi dimensional space, two D space, right? Two dimensional And it's spreading outwards along the, you know, along the planet, right? Uh, and, but it's also very localized, right? If you, you could draw a circle around it, vaccinate with all these people, for example, and block it, right? Um, but uh, so so in both cases, this local spread it has four degrees of freedom here to spread, you know, east west versus north south, for example. But it's also a constrained network geometrically, and in terms of how it's connected, and it's a uh, it's constrained and how it spreads, and that could lead it to, for example, die out. Without spreading to the whole network, right? It's just about going out here without having spread to this upper part, right? Um, in that sense, it's quite similar to a ring lattice network. You could get this extinction because it's too spread. Does that make sense? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. 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 Uh, professor? 
Can you hear me? Uh, yeah, sorry. Uh huh. Yeah. Uh, before you take the next local question, uh, Danica had asked, uh, do we wait for a meeting invite to discuss project deliverable two? So okay. maybe you could answer that. Sure. Um, so Thank they're you. hoping to discuss that. Yeah. So yes. Me, uh, oh, yeah. Yes. Uh, Danica, if you could, uh, that would be great. Um, I will try to send out, as I had noted today, I was uh, sick for much of last week, and uh, I am fortunately now better, and I've been sending out mail to teams to get together, so your team will be, uh, I'll, I'll probably send something out for a slot, um, send out an invitation within the next day. Okay, sounds good. I just wasn't sure if I needed to try to schedule or if we waited for you. No, no that'll be great if, if you wouldn't mind uh, waiting. I can I can suggest some spots. Okay, thank you. Okay, good. Good to Bye. Talk. Thanks. Bye bye. Thanks, yeah. Wade. Uh, thanks. Yes, I'm just gonna stop the recording.